to zero for a considerable period of time, you actually need to really make the conclusion that we are going to attract Jap Japanese situation. We're actually going to have growth of very, very low numbers and almost no inflation for the next sort of 10, 15 years. And I think that's still the conundrum that people are trying to get their head around is that, you know, the QE at the moment is keeping yields artificially low, but if the growth inflation picture picks up, will they actually have to start let, letting, will they actually have to start let, letting sort of QE sort of taper roll off and will we actually see yields move back up? I think that is, that is the big, that is the big debate and the big question of it. Yeah, I mean, any tapering and any yield um, pulling back up and rates pulling back up is, it seems, I think everybody agrees, is is a long way in the, a long way in the future. So, with with that in mind, I mean, where are investors, where are treasury managers going to start finding some returns? Because most of our listeners will be local authorities who are looking to support revenue budgets with with income um, or you know, Really, any every uh, though Treasury can't do much heavy lifting in this interest environment, there is an expectation of some returns. So, I mean, is it just a a matter of moving moving along the credit curve, taking more risk to get to get paid, or or is or are there other options? Yeah, I think if you look at the two ways in the past, you know that you've been able to to get extra yield. It's either moving up the interest rate curve. Or, or moving along the credit curve, as you say, and with the shape of yield curves now being so flat, you know, it's very, very difficult to move up that interest rate curve and actually pick up yield. And, you know, a good example of that now, certainly in that sort of treasury space is, you know, we we focus on um, certificates, deposits and commercial paper out to one year. And just to give you an example, you, you look at like a, you know, a singly rated bank currently, you know, they'll probably pay you somewhere in the region of three to four basis points for three months or four month money. But if you go all the way out to one year, you might be lucky to get above 10. So ultimately, you know, you're not really getting any additional yield for taking an extra eight, nine, 10 months worth of risk within your portfolio, which, you know, as an investor, you know, I, I would actually say, well, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, if you're not getting paid to take more risk, why not actually just stay you know, shorter dated maturity and just continue to roll it because the, the likelihood that rates are going to go up any time in the next few years is unlikely. So, you know, you may as well just keep your money short for the time being if not being paid to take that interest rate risk. The difference, I suppose, is in credit risk. So if you're still looking at that credit space, you know, if you actually start to move up into shorter dated credit, you know, so I'm talking about maybe one to, to three year corporate bonds, um, and we can also talk about things like covered bonds and, and RMBS as well, and, and, you know, maybe later down. But if we just think about credit in general, you know, you are still being compensated to increase credit risk. And if you look at um, just a good example, let's take covered bonds, you know, very, very strong asset, AAA rated, regulated, secured. You know, the yields roughly that you're getting on something like a, a sort of three year covered bond at the moment is it's probably Estonia plus. Sonia plus 25 to Sonia plus 30, let's say. Now, if you look at where they were trading pre-pandemic, they were probably trading about Sonia plus 35, Sonia plus 40. So, you know, we've kind of moved through the pandemic. You know, we've come out the other side. We've seen a lot of support from central banks, not just for sovereign markets, but for credit markets as well. And you're still being given that level of yield. And if you think about going forward, you know, what central banks want to do, you know, whether it's UK, whether it's US, whether it's Europe, they're they're keen to support banks to lend to corporates. They want corporates to borrow, to grow, to expand, to rebuild the economy, and therefore, you know, some of these products now have quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of central bank backing. You know, in terms of you know how they can borrow, how they can finance themselves. So, I think at the moment, if you do want to increase yield, it does make sense to move up that credit curve into assets that do have protection, whether that be security. And if you can't get security and you have to go into unsecured credit, it's really sensible to look at, you know, trying to buy into a diversified portfolio. Because what you don't want to do is have concentrated risk and credit. Uh, and then you have a situation that we saw in March where basically, you know, spreads blow out and you lose your access to liquidity uh, and you basically incur quite a large cap. So you want to try and diversify as much of that credit risk as you can. Yeah, I think you know, it's uh, unfortunately there's there's no new uh, there's no new ideas in 
in in in in treasury and cash is there you know diversification is 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 always going to be one of the key watchwords unfortunately there's no there's no magic bullet unfortunately for a lot of our clients and probably for a lot of our listeners unless you're managing quite a significant liquidity book getting sufficient diversification so you're not you know you know you're not putting yourselves in a in a significant concentration risk is always going to be relatively difficult you know there's you're going to have your if you've got if you're running a 10 20 million pound cash book it's quite difficult for you to Know, spread that over sufficient names where you'd have comfort, especially when you know, a cash book is by definition almost um, recycling at, at least you know, 10, 15 percent. So I suppose it's about trying to access products that give you that diversification, but without with almost, um, you know, without without asking you to to manage it. I mean, obviously, there's there's cash funds, there's cash plus funds, etc. But I suppose the question for me is when I'm looking at a cash plus fund is how diversified are those sorts of products? You know, what, what do they, what can they achieve that I can't on my own? Yeah, I think it's a really good, a really good question. You know, there's, there's, I think there's three, you know, if you look at the three funds that, that, so we run on the desk, you know, we run a liquidity type vehicle, we run a cash plus and we run an enhanced cash plus. Now, what is the difference between them? If you look at that liquidity type vehicle, it really is focused in those sort of short dated sort of sub three month type issues, uh, as well as, you know, sort of UK treasury bills. And if you look at the, the, the number of different issuers that we have in that type of fund, you know, we've probably got in the region of, of about sort of, 40 different issuers in that fund. Now it's not issues, but issuers, different sort of specific different names. So we do have a level of diversification in there, but that is constricted by the number of issuers in that space. And what we're actually seeing at the moment is those issuers are actually starting to decline because banks are so overrun with cash from depositors post pandemic, they just don't really want to take any more funding. So that's quite an interesting point to, to start with. The second point, if you look at our cash plus fund, because we can move out into these other assets, so it's a combination of those uh, sort of CDs and commercial paper, but it also has quite a lot of covered bonds in there. And that gives us more diversification because those covered bonds are issued by different global banks that aren't necessarily active in the money market. So we can get more diversification. We have about sort of 65 to 70 different issuers in our cash plus fund. So we're getting a bigger diversification. The interesting point there, though, is covered bonds now are, are being issued far less post the pandemic. And one of the reasons for that is because the bank are offering uh, a term funding scheme to banks to allow them to borrow at Bank of England base rate. So banks have effectively turned off their covered bond and their RMBS programs uh, for the time being because they can borrow much cheaper from the bank than having to issue covered bonds and RMBS bonds. So if you want to get access to these bonds now, they're literally like gold dust in the secondary market. So really the only way to access them is via a fund that already owns them. So that's, that's a really important point. Uh, the last fund that we've got, our enhanced cash fund, it, it just widens out that credit spectrum again. So it's looking at CDs and cash, but it also looks at you know one to three year corporate bonds um, that are fixed corporate bonds as well as floating corporate bonds. We look at covered bonds, we look at RMBS. So we're really widening out that broad remit we're then starting to broaden out, not just from financial instruments that you would see in money market space, but also look at those sort of UK corporates, things like insurers, things like regulated utility companies, which are all exempt from bail-in as well. It's a really good point as well, that if you think about our concentrated cash portfolio, if those banks get into trouble, you would be bailed in to, uh, to, to help in, in sort of the wind up of that bank. Whereas some of these instruments in these enhanced funds and these cash plus funds, are exempt from bailing. So it means that you don't tie up in terms of liquidity. It means that you know you still have access to those cash flows because they're going to still continue to, to function in that space. But you do have that extra credit risk and you just need to you need to weigh off that sort of credit risk versus uh, versus risk and return. But if you look at that fund, it's got about 130 different names in it, different issuers in it. So it's a really diversified portfolio where your exposure to any one name is sort of really getting down to to sort of just about 1%. So it's a much more diversified portfolio. And going back to your point at the start, if you're a sort of individual treasury function with 20 million cash, you know, trying to run that book, uh, 
you're probably going to be lucky if you're going to get more than three or four names in your portfolio. So you're going to have a really heavily concentrated portfolio. Uh, and if any one of those banks get into trouble, then you've obviously got a lot of capital at risk. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point to draw out, which is it's a very different game for somebody who's running 200 million pounds compared to somebody who's running 20. And I think that where, you know, whereas a 200 million pound book, if you're you know, washing out 20, 30 million pounds, that's 170 million pounds, you know, say that you can, you can sort of stick and diversify and, and manage as a, as a book um, whilst keeping everything else quite liquid. Whereas with a 20 million pound book, actually, being able to diversify is it's pretty difficult and so using those sorts of funds i mean it's a it's a good approach are you thinking of other practical things you know obviously you're you're you you have to keep an eye on liquidity as well for your funds so that so that if people need to make uh, we need to sell units they can i mean what sort of strategies do you use to ensure that you've got sufficient liquidity that maybe could be mirrored by uh, by treasury by by treasury managers, you know, in their own functions. Yeah, I, I think I think to start with, you know, we look at if you look at the three different funds, they all have different liquidity needs. But you know, if you think about like our our liquidity fund, where it needs to be able to provide large and vast amounts of liquidity at the drop of a hat, you know, you can come along and see a, an investor take out quite a large chunk of money. So. In that type of fund, we really are looking at investing in instruments that are readily liquid in the market. And I think this is quite an interesting point because even through the pandemic, you know, you know, if you had a, let, let's say you had a, a six month CD issued by Lloyd's um, singly rated bank and you tried to sell that uh, in the pandemic, whether, whether you're trying to sell 1 million, 2 million, or, or 50 million, you would have found that very, very hard, exceptionally hard to sell something that's, you know, really, really well-known name. Um, you know, uh, you'd expect that to be fairly liquid. And it just wasn't really, because people didn't want to take that. And the reason why they didn't want to take it is because every other fund manager in the city were trying to basically build up their own liquidity. So they didn't want to take six months paper on their books. So one of the first things is when you're trying to manage that liquidity, you need to keep your assets really, really short. You know, so if you look at our fund, we have a lot of treasury bills issued by the UK government. We've got a lot of sort of one month paper that sort of rolls down. So then it's almost like sub, we've always got a lot of proportion of the fund in sub one month money at any time. If you try to sell a big chunk of sort of like two week paper or three week paper, you've got a much better chance of selling that in a stress, a stress scenario because people are happy to take that on because they know it will mature in a few weeks time. They're not happy to take the longer maturities. So when you look at funds like the, the cash plus funds and the enhanced funds where they have less need to provide daily liquidity, but they do still need the option to provide liquidity and they will be investing in these longer assets of six month, nine month, one year assets. How do we manage liquidity in those funds? Well, in those funds, we, we have a, a natural waterfall. So we structure the fund so that when you look at the profile of the cash flows, on every given week, we've got a certain amount of maturity, a certain amount of money maturing every single week. So it's almost like a rolling, a uh, rolling payback of cash. So that we've always got money there, uh, enough for the expectations of what we expect our client outflows to be. But as a backup, again, in the pandemic, you know, if we see larger flows at that time, you know, what other types of assets can we sell in those types of funds? And that's where things like those covered bonds really came into their own in the pandemic. You know, these are AAA assets, they're regulated, um, they're over collateralized. Uh, and people were happy to say that, you know, in a stress now, in a pandemic, do I want to have these assets on my book? And the answer is probably I'm quite happy to buy them rather than buying unsecured CDs or unsecured commercial paper. Because if anything did happen to that institution, I know that I would continue to get my cash flow. I know I would get my maturity back. Um, and I know that I wouldn't be bailed in. So that, so those assets were highly liquid in that period. And I think a really interesting point now, if you look at what's happened post-pandemic, covered bonds and prime RMBS have been included in mortgage collateral, uh, approved mortgage collateral. So what you're finding now is that treasury desks at big banks and institutions are buying covered bonds and buying prime RMBS because they can post it as collateral 
against their derivative payments. So that's just a, just just shows you how uh, you know sort of that regulation and the security in those assets has been treated by the regulators to put them into that approved collateral space. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's quite a simple but powerful idea. The the cash laddering, as you you know, as we might term it, or the the idea that you know, if we think about our, our our clients and what what they might be wanting to do, they have um you know if they've got the twenty, they're in that that basically up to fifty fifty million pound space. One of the things that they might look to do is put you know, some cash that they know that they've got sort of as a core cash position out long term whether that's you know how however they wish to do that but really for the for the treasury element you know being a, one thing that our clients many of our clients have got access to as local authorities is the local to local market and where local authorities that want to lend and local authorities that want to borrow sort of can meet in the middle and that gives our clients quite a good opportunity to do cash laddering you know, they can if those that are investors they can put out you know, uh, loans to the local authorities for you know six nine twelve months and then as you say have a have basically a rolling maturity profile where they they know that they're going to have sufficient cash liquidity um and then any money that they've got left over they can almost just reinvest for another 12 months you know there's a, there's a nice healthy market there so i think using those sorts of approaches that professionals you know like yourselves uh, in in money managing use in their own treasury functions is is quite a, a strong idea and so is the idea of well if you're going to have anything that is a little bit concentrated making sure that it's extremely high credit quality that you're not you know, giving out uh you know you're not sticking sticking uh, your um sticking your money in a, a your, in one single named bank that perhaps hasn't got the the greatest credit etc so there's drawing out some some actually very interesting ideas in in in, in my view hopefully Hopefully, in the view of the uh, of our listeners as well. I think mean, moving on just to to think about before you know as our sort of last thoughts before we move on to questions. And if the listeners do have any questions, please please do uh, stick them in the chat box. Um, you know, we're eager to answer them. Um, I mean, when we talk about you know, using um, you know, covered bonds and and highly rated RMBS, it's it's a way of getting secured and and safer exposure to to banks but when we think about you know corporates and corporate books you know, what's the exposure what's what's the market like for, for for corporate paper at the moment have has it has it dried up have they taken the opportunity to to issue because of these low rates you know what's what's sort of the situation on the corporate market yeah in the corporate space they've they've actually um been focusing on longer maturity so I think you know, if you look at that corporate issuance again um, it's been more targeted at that sort of like 10 to, to 20 year time point we've also seen some corporates go even further out you know into sort of like the, the you know the sort of 50 year space because you know just to give you an example you know where yields are you know in, in the government space next week we've got a 2061 bond being issued and you know it's got a it's got a, a coupon of half a percent, you know, and it's probably going to get issued at a yield, you know, not much greater than sort of three quarters of a percent. So if you think about, you know, sort of the typical credit spread out there at the moment, you know, credit spreads are probably still sort of depend on the names in the region of sort of like, you know, 120 to 150 basis points. So if a corporate can can issue for 40 or 50 years at just over 2 percent, you know, that's that's something that they're going to be really keen to, to try and do to basically take funding onto their business. What they're, what they're, we've seen less of though is really less issuance in that short space. You know, if, if I actually look in corporate world, we've not seen much corporates issued sub five years, uh, certainly over the last uh, over the last few months. So really, what we're having to do in the corporate space where we want to get diversification in our in our enhanced fund is look to the secondary market to try and pick up some paper. And the interesting thing in the secondary market is. There's some reasonably good names out there in the sort of just sub one year. And one of the reasons why we get a bit of interest in or can pick up some interest in that sub one year corporate space is because a, a credit index uh, typically is one year and longer. So when credit bonds that go sub one year fall out of the credit index, benchmark or credit fund managers don't want to own sub one year paper in their fund they basically sell that sub one year paper and buy something longer that's actually on benchmark 
So there is a little bit of um, supply in the secondary market in that sort of nine months to one year paper. And at the moment, we've been picking that up um, for the funds. So in the region of about sort of like 0.8 to 1%. So it's quite, it's quite nice bits of paper. You know, it's got one year to maturity, so it's quite short credit risk uh, in things like single A uh, names. Uh, and, you know, we're getting paid a nice yield. We're getting 100 basis points over Sonia for, for one year risk, which is really hard to get in that sort of, bank space, you know, you look at, as I said at the start of the call, bank papers for issuing you, it's lucky if it's issuing you more than 10 basis points. So you're getting a nice pickup uh, for a single for a, for a single A rated name, which is really comparable with a single A rated bank. You know, you've effectively got unsecured credit risk. Uh, in the in the sort of two to three year space, you get the same problem in the credit curve that you get in the in the in the money curve. It's very flat from there on out. So when you start to go from one year out to three year, you're not getting paid that much more to loan three-year credit as you are uh, for one-year credit. And give you a good example, somebody approached me this morning with a triple B plus um, uh, regulated utility company that were looking to issue in the three-year at probably a yield of about 1.2%. So, you know, would I rather have triple B plus paper at three-year at 1.2% or would I rather have single A paper at one year at 1%. Well, I'd have the 1% singly paper at one year all day long because it's, it's much better credit risk um, and you're not having to give up that much in yield. And I think that is a situation that we're seeing by our investors is that people are starting to shorten down the yield curve because they just feel that they're not being compensated for taking longer dated duration uh, and credit risk. Great. Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh... That's an interesting, an interesting overview. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to give. Um, I think we that sort of a good place to to draw draw a line under uh, draw a line under today. Um, I can't see any questions in the chat box, but I will give um, people a moment just to to type uh, any questions they may have in. Uh, while we're waiting, I'll just uh, remind everybody that uh, you should follow us on uh, on LinkedIn and Twitter if you don't already, and um, that um, if the uh, if if you're uh, if you're free this time next week, um, Nick Keeling will be talking about housing associations and the differences and uh, similarities between local authority treasury and uh, housing association treasury functions, and how actually um, we may see local authorities moving into a situation where they're more like housing association treasury functions than they are uh, than they are currently. So, unless. Uh, the, Unless I'm uh, I'm mistaken, I can't see any uh, any questions at the moment. So um, I suppose that means uh, that all leaves me to say thank you very much to Craig for joining us for a, an enlightening discussion, and uh, to thank everybody for joining us, and to hopefully see you all again next week. Thank you. Thanks very much.